morning and welcome to worship this morning. Let's us all stand together. I know you're in your home, but let's all rejoice and sing. This is Memorial Day. It's a great day of uh, just remembrance, and we want to sing um, songs about that, and we also want to sing some songs that just uplift the Lord this morning. Let's sing it. Here in this worn and weary land where many a dream has died. Like a tree planted by the water, we never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire just to know you and to make you known we lift your name on high shine like the sun may darkness run and hide we know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Oh, 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 oh. And to your word know our Father's heart, and to the world we're reaching out to show them who you are, so living water flowing through, God we thirst for more of you, fill our hearts and fill our souls with one desire, just to Anything is possible, joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible, joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible, joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible, just to Shine light, the sun made darkness run and hide. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Oh. 
and welcome to Winterville First Baptist Church online. We're so thrilled that you're here with us. If you're visiting our website or our Facebook page today, we certainly want to give you a warm welcome on this uh, Sunday morning, uh, May the 24th. We're so glad uh, that we're able to worship together uh, by these means. Um, by way of announcements, you sh uh, should have seen as we uh, were scrolling through the um, announcements, we have a, a few things that we've uh, put out by means of uh, our, our reopening of the church, and you should have received that um, either by email, or if you haven't received it by email yet, you will receive a hard copy of that in the mail uh, that gives you an, um, just a detailed list of what uh, we're going to be asking of you, so please pay attention to those talk about it as a family and let us know if you have any questions we're glad to answer those for you remember tomorrow is uh, Memorial Day and, and the office will be closed uh, so um, if you try to ca call us you won't get an answer so uh, please uh, uh, continue to in your faithfulness to give as uh, you have already been doing so we're so excited about that if you also you should have noticed on there I'm putting this out a little bit early uh, but in October on the 11th of our homecoming we're going to be having the Kingsman Quartet uh, from North Carolina that will be with us and so we're excited about that I know I am if you're not a Southern Gospel fan you will definitely enjoy the Kingsmen they've been around for years they are um, um, Hall of Famers they've won several Dove Awards and so we're just uh, thrilled that they are able to come and be with us that morning uh, for worship as we are going to be back um, full swing I'm just believing that but by that time so let's just uh, be praying for that as I know you are Let's continue in our worship as we sing a song that says, Because of your love. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we've come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we'll forgive that. Because of your Oh, 
cause of your Let me uh, extend my welcome like uh, Brian has done for all of those of you uh, joining us online and uh, thank you for uh, watching this morning and if this is the first time or one of the first few times you've uh, uh, joined us online we are uh, grateful for that uh, as well. If you'll be finding your Bible there where you're at and turning to the book of Ruth, I am currently preaching through uh, the book of Ruth is between Judges and 1 Samuel. Uh, it's sandwiched in between the books of Judges and First uh, Samuel. It's uh, so good to have all of you here with us. And again, as Brian has said, please familiarize yourself with the email or snail mail you should have received about our reopening in two weeks from today on June 7th. There are several things that we're going to ask you to do and that you're going to have to do when you arrive from worship like uh, having your temperature checked and going through some diagnostic questions and things like that. So please familiarize yourself with those things before uh, June the 7th. Uh, Ruth chapter 1, this morning I'm going to be looking at verses 6 through 22 and uh, ask this question, how do you respond to tragedy? When tragedy comes in your life, how do you respond to tragedy? Ruth chapter 1, let's look at verses 6 through 22. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they can, may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, and should I also bear sons, would you wait for them till they are grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord also, to, the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had, came, had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time of year when we're reminded uh, men and women had to lose their lives so that we could be here and worship freely this morning without any threat or danger of uh, being arrested uh, or being sent to prison. We thank you for our freedom to assemble and our freedom to worship. Lord, we pray for the many... Uh, men and women all throughout the world who do not have this freedom or uh, this uh, freedom comes at a great cost and aggravation and impediment from the government 
And so, Lord, we pray today for those brothers and sisters, and we pray you grant them the freedom to assembly and the freedom to worship. We thank you for the word we read today. Lord, may our heart be open to what the Spirit wants to say and do here in this place and through this word today. Uh, we pray that you would hear us as we worship you, as we sing. We pray that you would come uh, and meet us just where we're at. And we pray all these things in Christ's mighty name. Amen. Brian, you come, sir. It seems really weird to not have anyone here in the room with us uh, so that we can do a proper Memorial Day um, tribute uh, to our military in recognition of those who have uh, lost their lives in war. Um, having had a grandfather who was in the, um, the Army, my dad was in the Army, my uncle was in the Army, I've got several cousins who are currently serving um, in the Marines, and, and so patriotism is something that's, that's ingrained in me, and it should be you as well as a member of the, and as a citizen of this great country that we live in. And so today we're going to take this uh, song, The Battle Hymn of the Republic, and I hope that it just means uh, something even more today as we talk about freedom and how we seem to have been stripped of our, our, our rights and freedoms by not being able to come together. But this is a different kind of, of uh, sacrifice that we're making today as we are uh, sacrificing um, the safety by not being together, but we can, we can know that soon we will be together. So let's sing the battle hymn. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath were stored. He has looted his fatal lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Fires of a hundred circling camps, laying his build in him an altar in the evening dews and dams. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him, be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on.
Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine. I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold. My shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overcome the grave. To this I my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. All oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ. I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne, to this I My lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. 
Yet not I, but through Christ in me. sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, and where you When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Ruth chapter 1, if you've not found your place 
there or you've lost it, Ruth chapter 1. It was 1818 in France, and there was a little boy named Louis who was nine years old who was sitting uh, in his father's workshop. The father was a harness maker, and the little boy loved to watch his dad uh, work on leather to make harnesses. Someday, father said, Louis, I want to be a harness maker just like you. And so his dad asked him the question. He said, why not start now? And so the dad took a piece of leather. He drew a design on it. He said, now, son, you take the hole puncher and the hammer and follow the design and be careful that you don't hit your hand with a hammer. And so excited, the little boy began to work. And, but when he hit the hole punch, it flew out of his hand, and it flew up, and the hole punch pierced his eye. He lost sight in his eye immediately, and later on in his life, the sight in his other eye failed. Lewis was now totally blind. And a few years later, Lewis was sitting in the family garden when a friend of his brought him a pine cone. And as Lewis ran his fingers over the sensitive uh, pine cone, an idea came to him. He became enthusiastic and he began to create an alphabet of raised dots on paper so that the blind could feel and interpret what was being written. Thus, Lewis Braille opened up a whole new world for blind people, all because of a tragedy. Now, Lewis could have sat around and uh, swallowed in self-pity. Uh, he could have made himself a victim. And instead, that tragedy spurred him on to do something great and to not only help himself, but help so many other people. And last week, we left the story of Ruth and her daughters-in-law at a point of tragedy. All three of these women are now widows. Uh, within a span of just a short amount of time, uh, Ruth's husband and uh, her, sons in -law, her, her sons died and had left her and her tutored daughters-in-law as uh, widows. And so the story ends uh, in chapter 5 with tragedy, and it picks up in verse 6, and this, we're still in the middle of this tragedy and what we see in the story, as I read it to you this morning, is that Naomi did not react with a faith-driven, God-exalting, God-trusting, uh, faith-in-God response to the tragedy that she found herself in. And so many times in our lives when tra tragedy comes, we do not respond in a God-exalting, faith-driven way. Instead, we wallow in tragedy, we become negative in tragedy, and we allow it to define us rather than looking to God himself and saying, God, out of this tragedy, uh, use it for your honor and your glory and my advancement in the gospel. And I want to see in the text that we uh, have, that I've read to you this morning, four ways that uh, people respond to tragedy in their life and we're going to see as this story goes on there's really only one way and that was by uh, Ruth herself uh, how she responded to tragedy that's correct the first way that oftentimes we respond to tragedy I want you to see is in verses 6 through 10 and that is ignoring God's grace look in verses 6 through 10 then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. What's happened? Ten years earlier, there's a famine in Bethlehem. And we read that up in verse 1 last week. And so that caused um, Naomi and uh, her family to um, make a bad decision, a wrong decision, and leave Bethlehem, which we uh, saw last week. Ironically, Bethlehem means house of bread. And they left the promised land, they left the place of blessing, and they went to Moab, which were the enemies of Israel. And so this uh, difficulty in their life caused them to make a bad decision. But God's uh, sovereignty and his providence is working in this story, and we're going to see how that happens even later on. And now these women have heard, even 50 miles away in Moab, that God has... Uh, begin to bless Bethlehem. Why did this happen? We don't know. Maybe uh, people there began to repent. It's possible that God allowed a famine to occur because of Israel's disobedience. And so 
in this story, uh, Naomi decides to leave Moab and she decides to return to her, her, her own country and her two daughters-in-law are with her in verse 7 and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah as well. And so here we have these two women who are not citizens of the nation of Israel. They are uh, women of Moab who had married the daughters of Naomi. And so they're wanting to return to Bethlehem with her. And Naomi said in verse 10 to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to your mother's house. Now the word return plays a prominent place in the book of Ruth. It is found uh, ten times here. And again, there's a word play going on here. God has returned in his faithfulness to Bethlehem. And Naomi is returning to Bethlehem. And her daughters-in-law want to go with her. And yet she's trying to get them to do what? To return to her mother's house, their mother's house. Now, in a patriarchal society that this is in, why doesn't Naomi say, return to your father's house? Well, it's possible that both of these women had lost their father as well, and maybe their, it's only their mother who's living. The word that's used in Hebrew here in verse 8 for mother's house also carries with it some connotations of marriage and also carries some connotations with it of uh, that this is where marriages were arranged at the mother's house. And so maybe in some indirect way she's saying, return to your mother's house, allow uh, your mom to arrange a marriage for you. And uh, verse 8 is also the beginning in the book of Ruth where um, the dialogue between characters begin. We saw last week in verses 1 through 5, there's not a lot of dialogue. There are 85 verses in the book of Ruth and 56 of those are people talking and so the message is really in what they say. And she says, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and me. Naomi begins to be a bad witness and a bad representative for the God of Israel in this verse. Now, why would she not want her two daughters-in-law, who are pagans, who are descendants of Lot, who, by the way, Lot left the promised land when he was given the opportunity in the book of Genesis, when it was discovered that his servants and the servants of his uncle Abraham could not dwell together because there were too many of them, there was too much livestock, Abraham looked a lot and said, you pick which direction you want to go in the promised land. And Lot, in fact, did not pick a place in the promised land to go. Where did he pick, pick to go? He picked to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so here, generations later, you have the descendants of Lot who are now wanting to return to the promised land and to the God of Israel. And Naomi is doing everything within her power, uh, either directly or indirectly, to keep them from going there. She says, the Lord grant that you may find rest each in his house of, of her husband. Now, again, the word rest there plays prominently into this story. What was the promised land? The promised land was a place of rest. It was a place where Israel could rest from its enemies. It was a place where uh, it could rest from its wanderings in the wilderness. And because Israel disobeyed God to begin with, they walked 40 years in the desert and in the wilderness. And as a commentary on that, we read in the Psalms, it says, And God did not give them rest. And so Naomi here is talking to them. She said, May you find rest instead, possibly in the lives of in, in the homes of new husbands, she kissed them. They lifted their voices and they wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return to you and your people. They're persistent, if not anything. Naomi, again, has done a, is doing a poor job here of recognizing the goodness and the grace of God in this whole tragedy and this whole story that's going on. She missed four parts of the picture of God's divine grace in this story. Number one, it was a gift from God in the midst of her grief and pain that Naomi was able to hear the good news. And so she had heard the good news that there was now bread in Bethlehem. And it was nothing other than the grace of God that while they were in Moab that she was able to hear this good news. Number two, Naomi heard God had intervened and visited on behalf of his people. The word visited here means to come to the aid of this was definitely an act of God's grace toward his people in Israel. 
Even though Israel had forgotten him, God had not forgotten Israel. Even in the midst of their sin, and even in the midst of all that was going on that we could go back to the book of Judges and read about and all their disobedience, God again was choosing to bless Israel. Number three, the object of God's divine favor is identified as his people, Israel, back in verse 6. Even though they had disobeyed him, God was still being merciful toward them. Did Bethlehem, did Israel deserve the blessing of God visiting them and God, God blessing them with bread? Absolutely not. And again, here's the last one, and I mentioned this before. God had given his people bread. Bethlehem was now becoming the house of bread again, even in the midst of this famine. And so, folks, sometimes in the middle of tragedy, we are so often tempted to ignore God's goodness to us in the midst of tragedy. There are good things going on. There are things to thank God for, to bless God for, even in the midst of difficulty. But we need to have our spiritual eyes and ears open during these times of tragedy. Dr. Warren Wearsby tells this story. Many years ago, I was in a prayer meeting with a number of Youth for Christ leaders, among them a man named Jacob Stam, who was the brother of John Stam, who with his wife Betty was martyred in China in 1934. We had been asking God to bless this ministry and that project, and I suppose the word bless was being used scores of times as we prayed. Then Jacob Stam prayed, Lord, We've asked you to bless all these things, but please, Lord, make us blessable. Had Naomi been in that meeting, she too would have had to confess, Lord, I am not blessable. Why? Because she had forgotten God's goodness and God's grace to her, who ten years before had left in the middle of a famine and she had found food. Now she had women who... She's a widow and she's an old woman and they're willing to go with her and take care of her and all that seemed to have disappeared and gone out of her mind. It is a possibility and a real thing for us to forget God's goodness and God's grace to us in the midst of tragedy. Psalm 103, 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Why did the psalmist say, and forget not all of his benefits? Because we can forget his benefits. Naomi had forgotten God's benefits to her. It even says in the book of Judges about the nation of Israel during this time in Judges 3, 7. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served Baals and Asherah. So what God had done for them and released them from Egyptian bondage and all these other things had completely left their mind. Psalm 77, 9 through 11. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Of course, the answer to that question is no. Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? No. And I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I remember your wonders of old. And so time and time again, in place and place, all throughout the Bible, in good times or bad times, we are prone to forget God's grace to us. And Naomi had done that in this story. She responded wrongly to the tragedy that had visited her because she had ignored God's grace to her and she had ignored God's grace to her people. The second reaction in this is embracing worldly wisdom. Look at verses 11 through 14. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? They were not content to take no for an answer. And it says, Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? And the word in the womb there literally means in my insides. What is she saying here? She is talking about an Old Testament principle called leveret marriage. And what did that mean? That meant that if a man died and left his wife as a widow, if he had an unmarried brother, it was that unmarried brother's responsibility to marry the widow and take care of her. And if they had no children, for them to have children and continue the name of the deceased brother. And so it was called leveret marriage, 
Uh, we're we're going to see that principle here with Boaz by the end of the book of Ruth. And so that's what Naomi's referring to. Uh, am I pregnant with sons who I can have who can grow up and one day marry the two of you? Turn back, verse 12, my daughters, and go, I am too old to have a husband. Uh, if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Let's say she's 40, and let's say she, uh, or let's say she's 50, and she has sons, and by the time she has sons and they're old enough to grow up and get married, these women who are her daughters-in-law may uh, very well be too old to even bear children. Um, and, and again, she's asking all these rhetorical questions. Would you wait for them, verse 13, until they're grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? Are you going to wait and not marry someone else? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And again, here she is being negative Naomi. God's hand has not gone out against her. She has so much to be thankful for. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Notice the reaction of the two daughters-in-law here. Orpah is willing to go back to Moab, but Ruth clung to her. The word clung here is used uh, in different places in the Bible to refer to the marriage relationship. And so here's a woman, uh, Ruth, who is to be commended for her love, her concern, the fact that she's going to take care of her mother-in-law and all these things. And Naomi can only say what? The only way that this problem is going to be fixed is that is, I, is if I have sons and you all wait for them to be grown. There's only one problem in her. There's one glaring problem in her answer. She has no husband. How is she going to have children if she has no husband? By this time, she's probably been a widow a very long time. They've been in Moab 10 years. Her uh, daughters-in-law did not have children when they were married to their husbands before they died. We saw nothing about that in verses 1 through 5 last week. Is it possible that these women cannot bear children? Is that why we haven't read to that anywhere? God could have worked a miracle in the life of Naomi. Has she forgotten that Sarah, when she was 90, gave birth to a child? But what she got her eyes on? She has her eyes on one human uh, answer and uh, way that this problem is going to be fixed in her life and in the lives of her daughters-in-law. And that is what? That possibly some way she's going to get married, she's going to have sons, they're going to grow up, and they're going to marry these women. And that is what? That is worldly wisdom. All of us are guilty at some time or another of looking at tragedy, of looking at problems in our lives and say, here's how I'm going to fix this. And the way that you and I say that we're going to fix this is a worldly way, an ungodly way, a way that has no biblical precedent, a way that has no biblical principles in it, and we just know for sure that this is the way that God is going to work and God is going to act. And in the end, God is not within a million miles of it. God was not within one million miles of the possibility that Naomi brought up here about her daughters-in-law and how they were going to be taken care of. Could it have, could it have been possible for these women to go to Bethlehem and be converted to the God of Israel and then be able to marry men from the nation of Israel. That was a great possibility. And for them to embrace the God of Israel and come to know them. And Naomi has done what? She has completely removed that from the picture. And she is not doing what? She is not exercising godly wisdom, but she is exercising worldly wisdom. This is such a danger to every one of us is to have this all figured out, is to have things thought through, planned out, 
and it be worldly wisdom and a worldly way to deal with tragedy in our lives and not a godly way. James, in his little book, talks about the difference between worldly wisdom and demonic wisdom when he writes these words in James 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter and envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. What, what kind of wisdom, James? The wisdom that has bitter envy and self-seeking. But it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, Confusion and every evil thing are there. That's what characterizes demonic wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above, or the wisdom that is from heaven, the wisdom that is from God, is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In that passage, James says what? Here's the difference in worldly or demonic wisdom, and here's the difference in godly wisdom. Naomi was embracing worldly wisdom in the way that she suggested, in the way that she proposed this issue and the tragedy of the death of her son and the sons-in-law, and all three of them remaining as widows should be handled, and she was not even close to the way that God eventually is going to deal with with Ruth by the end of this story and before the book is over with. Be careful about embracing worldly wisdom when you you and I encounter the problems of life because worldly wisdom can get us deeper and farther into problems and trouble and possibly ultimately sin than it can uh, embracing God's wisdom that has uh, our best and God's glory at its center. So how can we wrongly respond to tragedy in our life? We can ignore God's grace. We can embrace godly wisdom. Verses 15 through 17, exercise bold faith in God. This is the only right response in this story. And it was not by someone who was a member of the nation of Israel. It is by a woman who is a Moabitess. It is a woman who is a descendant of Lot. Um, What do we see in verse 15? And she said, look, your sister-in-law, Naomi's talking to Ruth. Your sister-in-law, Orpah, has gone back to her people and to her gods. Why does Naomi even recognize the existence of the false gods of Moab? By the way, his name was uh, Chemosh. Why does she even recognize the existence of a false deity? And again, she is not a good poster child for the God of Israel. Because we read in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what? There is not but one God, and that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and all the other patriarchs in Israel, and the God and Father of our Lord and Jesus Christ. And here's a woman named Ruth who is doing her best, who wants to know the God of Israel and what is her mother-in-law doing. Her mother-in-law is sending her back to Moab and to false gods who at that time it was believed by many people that different false gods reigned over certain countries and provinces and, and areas. And maybe that's what Naomi's getting to here. She says, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me. And the word there says, urge me not back to leave you or to turn back from following after you. And again, Ruth's attitude, her actions, everything in this story that she does is to be commended. She's trying to love, minister, stand up for, take care of her mother-in-law, who possibly at this time may be elderly. She's a widow Um, she's at the lowest rung on the social ladder in this society and here is poor Ruth doing everything humanly possible to take care of her and she keeps getting the answer no 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 for wherever you go I will go and wherever you lodge I will lodge now many times that verse is quoting it quoted in a wedding ceremony and it has nothing to do with marriage 
It has everything to do with friendship. It has everything to do with care and concern and mercy toward other people. Your people shall be my people. Now that's a mouthful. Ruth is willing to turn her back on her lineage and her people in Moab. She is willing, essentially she is willing to get up, give up her citizenship in Moab to become a citizen of Bethlehem. In her day, this is saying a lot. And your God, my God. The word in Hebrew that she uses there for God in verse 16 is Yahweh. That is the name that is used for the God who makes covenant with people and who keeps his covenant. This is the name for God as he spoke to himself to one of Naomi's ancestors, Abraham, in Genesis 12. When he made the Abrahamic covenant, land, seed, and blessing were the three things that Abraham would receive as a result of God's covenant with him. There's very little mention or talked about in the Old Testament about conversion, but this is one of those places in the Old Testament where we get as close to conversion as possible. Ruth is wanting to convert from worshiping the gods of Moab to the God of Israel. Your God will be my God. I'm going to give up my false deity, and I'm going to embrace the God of Israel. And where you die, I will die. Now, several generations ago, it was this way here in our country, but it's not so much this way now. You were born, lived, and died pretty much all in the same area. And where you were buried said a lot about where you lived your life and your family and where they buried you and who you were buried with. And so this is a mouthful. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And so what she's saying, I'm willing to forsake my homeland. I'm, for, for, I'm willing to forsake my people. I'm willing to forsake my God, and I'm willing to go with you. I'm willing to be converted. I'm willing to, be, I'm willing to adopt a whole new people, and not just for a short term, for a long term. And when I die, I do not want them to send my remains back to Moab to be buried. I want to be buried with you and with your people. I've told this joke, but I'll tell it again. This boy was dating a girl, and he loved her, and he wanted to propose to her, but he was really bashful, and he didn't know what to say, and he wanted to ask her to get married, and the only thing he could ask her was, when you die, do you want to be buried with my people? You know, what was he saying? Do you, do you want to get married and us stay married, and then when you die, you're going to be buried with my people instead of your people? That's exactly what's going on here in the beginning of verse 17. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Somebody in this story actually got it right, and it was not the person who was the descendant of Abraham. It was the person who was the descendant of Lot, who was a foreigner, who was a Moabite, and Ruth is the one who actually got it right. What did she say? I'm going to trust the God of Israel. Had she heard Naomi talk about him? Had she heard Naomi tell stories about all that God did in the wilderness is he released her ancestors from Egyptian bondage and they wandered around and God provided for them. I couldn't help but think about in Joshua when the spies encountered Rahab the harlot, a very similar in that she was not a Israelite, Joshua 2. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water. This is Rahab speaking to the spies. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. What Rahab said in Joshua 2 is very similar to what Ruth says here in verses 16 and 17. She says, and your God shall become my God. Rahab said in Joshua 2, The Lord your God, He is in heaven above and on earth beneath. She rejected and turned her back on the gods of Jericho, the city where she lived. This is a God-exalting, faith-driven response in the God of Israel. And in this story, a foreigner did it. We will see this as this story goes on. 
But this is the beginning of a great story about God's goodness to people outside of Israel. Now, the Israelites, they were his chosen people. They were his covenant people. But all throughout the Old Testament, we even read things like what Israel was to be a light to the nations. And whether it's Rahab and Joshua and whether it's Ruth here, people came to know and embrace the God of Israel. And here we have a woman wanting to do that. And one of his chosen people are making it as hard and as difficult for her as she possibly can. What am I supposed to do In times of tragedy, I should exercise bold faith in God and trust God. There's more to this story, and none of these women know that. What's the rest of the story? Ruth is going to meet a wonderful man. His name's Boaz. They're going to be married. And who's one of their descendants going to be? Jesus. Boaz is going to be good to her. She's going to be more blessed than she could ever imagine. She's going to become part of the covenant community. And yet none of these women know any of that yet. And folks, none of us, me, you, or anybody else, our stories have not been finished being written. God's doing a story and a work in my life, and God's doing a story and a work in your life, and the final ink has not been put on the page. And tragedy is going to be a part of that in your story and my story, just like it's in this story here. And Ruth says, I choose to believe and to trust the God of Israel and to return there and to turn my back essentially on what? On my people, my sin, the false gods we worship, and embrace and trust and believe in the God of Israel. I couldn't help but think about this page, this verse in Hebrews 11. For those who say such things declare declare plainly, they seek a homeland. Ruth was wanting what? She was seeking a new homeland. She was turning her back on the things of Moab. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared his city for them. And folks, we are doing what? We are seeking a new homeland in heaven. We are seeking a greater city, a new city. And on my journey to the celestial city, there are going to be tragedy, there are going to be heartache, there are going to be times that I can get sidetracked in bypass meadow, as it were. But what I need to be doing is making faith-filled, God-honoring, faith-saturated responses to these tragedies and difficulties in my life. Lastly, in verses 19 through 22, I think we see Naomi at her worst in verses 19 through 22 in what I'm calling exhibiting bitterness toward God. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. So what do we see? Ruth goes with Naomi. Orpha goes back to Moab. They return. It's been 10 years since Naomi left. 10 years, a lot of water under the bridge. And it happened when they'd come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Now, who did they not pay any attention to? They did not pay any attention to Ruth. You know, she left and had these men with her. And she comes back. The men are not here. The the woman's here. And so here they are standing around doing what people do when somebody comes back who's been gone a long time. Who is this? Is this really, is that really Naomi? Had her appearance changed? It's been 10 years. She's lost a husband. She's lost two sons. Is her face weathered? Is there a story in the wrinkles of her face? And she hears them talking in verse 20. Do not call me Naomi. And by the way, Naomi means pleasant one. Instead, call me Mara. You know what Mara means? It means bitter. That's actually a geographical location in Exodus 15. While Israel was out in the wilderness, they needed water, and they went to a place, and there were springs of water there, and the water was bitter, and they called it Mara, because in Hebrew, Mara means bitter. And uh, in that story in Exodus, God told them to cut down a tree, and it fell in the water, and it became sweet. And she says, don't call me pleasant one, call me bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Nothing could be farther from the truth. 
Hadn't she found food when she went to Moab? Didn't she live there 10 years? Wasn't she taken care of 10 years? Doesn't she now have a daughter-in-law who has pledged her loyalty to her and to take care of her for the rest of her life and even move and relocate with her and she's saying God has dealt bitterly with me? That is not true. I tell you what, what's wrong. Naomi is bitter. She is bitter, but she is not bitter because God has dealt bitterly with her. She got better than she deserved because what did she deserve? Her and her family deserved to die because of their disobedience at the end of the story. They left God's promised land and went to the enemy and sought help from the enemy and they did not seek help from God. So she says, God has dealt bitterly with me and in the end God had not dealt bitterly with her. God had been very good to her. And I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. And in the margin of my Bible, I wrote, no, that's not true. Who had been feeding her? Who had been taking care of her? Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? The word she uses for Almighty here is El Shaddai, and it has beautiful connotations in it that El Shaddai is the Almighty God who can do anything, and yet she's saying what? He hasn't done anything. Nothing could be further from the truth. And again, what's the problem here? She is a poor witness. Why? She's negative. This is something God is dealing with me about and talking to me about. And it's this. When you and I speak negatively, as Naomi did here about a situation, what we have done is not allowed ourselves to look with the eyes of faith at a situation and expectantly await what God could do. And that's what she's doing. She's just saying, God has been bitter to me. God has not been... All right, there we go. Instead of having a faith-driven response, we get negative and we fail to see, first of all, how good God has been to us. All of us could stand up today where you're at. You could say, God has been better to me than I deserve. And so if he has been better to me than I deserve, folks, there is no room for bitterness. And yet, what do we see in this story? That's exactly what happened to Naomi. And she blames it on God. And so she says, don't, don't call me pleasant one, call me bitter. Ephesians 4, 13, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. A bitter Christian is not a good witness. And yet I know people who know Christ who are bitter. Listen, life has not treated any of us perfect. Life had been very cruel to Naomi, but at the end of the day, God had been very, very good to her. And listen to when what's going on when they enter Bethlehem. Verse 22, Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. The bread is rolling in the drought or whatever it was that caused the famine is over and the, the, the crop is being harvested and the food is rolling in and God in his providence is working in this story as he's worked at the very beginning. He's worked to get her out of Moab and to get her daughter-in-law out of Moab and to get them back to Jerusalem because he's going to raise up a kinsman redeemer to marry Ruth and ultimately be the great, 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 great grandparents of the Redeemer of Israel. And they have entered Bethlehem at the perfect time to get there. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without no, which no one will see the Lord, 
looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up cause trouble, and by this many has become defiled. Bitterness begins as a small root, but it produces an awful, awful crop. And somewhere, someday, Naomi began to get bitter, and instead of pulling that bitterness up by the root and throwing away, she nursed it, and she nursed it, and she nursed it, and it got bitter, and it did what? It produced a, a crop, and it was a crop that she didn't want, and it's a crop that none of us wants. Listen to me. Our bitterness in times of tragedy can just destroy us. It can blind us and keep us from seeing the blessings of God and keep us from seeing even what? That God's grace and God's providence in this story is he brought them in at the right time and then he, it even can blind us to God's goodness even in the midst of this. There is a God-exalting, faith-driven way to respond to tragedy in our life and then, folks, there is a worldly, fleshly, ungodly, unchrist-like, non-Christ-exalting way to respond to tragedy in your life. And it is my responsibility as a follower of Jesus Christ to make sure that I respond in a way that always and every way brings much honor, glory, and fame to Jesus. Let's pray, and then Brian's going to come sing us out of here, and we'll be dismissed. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this story that is in fact true. We thank you for the fact that it speaks to us thousands of years from uh, thousands of years later where we believe, uh, God, that uh, uh, in the midst of tragedy that we should lean on you, seek you, be driven to you, love you, point others to you. Lord, help us to be a good witness. Help us from drinking the, the water of bitterness help us to be one that looks at things with the eyes of faith and trust in you and not the world and so we pray these things in jesus great name brian you sing us out here sir blessed assurance jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. All the day long. Well, I hope you have a great week.
and uh, look forward to hearing from you and uh, hope that you uh, just uh, have a great time of today if you're with your family and if you have a, a time of, of, of get together tomorrow if you're able to do that be blessed we love you thank you so much Thank you.